Hello, everyone, and welcome to Church Online. It's great to have you with us. And although I miss seeing you face to face, it's truly wonderful to have this technology where we can meet online. These are truly unusual times. This is a truly unique and historic moment, not quite like anything we've experienced in our lifetime. Right now, our government leaders are meeting, trying to figure out what would be the next steps to take. These are uncharted water. They are unsure what exactly to do. Is the worst of this pandemic finally over? Will our hospitals be overtaxed with the needs that are developing? Will we have all the medical resources that we need to deal with whatever comes next? Is it time to try to restart the economy? And if so, how exactly is the best way to do that? These are truly uncharted waters. So we should be praying for our government officials. They certainly need God's wisdom. Another thing that has probably reached historic levels is the amount of fear and anxiety out there. I suppose that is understandable because we are experiencing things we've never experienced before in our lifetime. The other day, my wife went to the grocery store and to need to stand in line with a mask on. That's something we never needed to do before. And what was especially heartbreaking is she said the level of fear out there was palpable. You could sense it. There was no lighthearted talk, no joking. People seemed very focused, very intense. They wanted to get into the store and make sure the, the needed groceries would be there for them. And I can understand the fear, anxiety, and stress. We are seeing our world turned upside down. We are seeing things we never thought we'd see. Jobs shutting down. Schools being closed. Hospitals are all on high alert. We are now standing online at grocery stores for basic necessities. And there's plenty of bad news on TV. And it's not only on TV. Some of you find yourselves unemployed or underemployed right now because of COVID-19. Many of us are concerned about the safety and health and well-being of loved ones. Even if we're strong believers, we can find ourselves dealing with a little bit of anxiety right now. Well, today I thought it would be good to meet someone in the Bible just like us. This is a person that is witnessing their world coming unglued. And they begin to feel a lot of anxiety and fear. Now, this is a person who is not normally given to anxiety and fear, so this catches them by surprise. We're going to see how they got through this. How do you handle stress? Some of you are probably thinking, well, not very well right now. Thanks for asking. Well, how, how do you cope with anxiety and stress when it looks like your world is coming unglued? Fortunately, you and I are not the first ones to experience this. The Bible has an account of someone that I think we'll all be able to relate to. And as we look at this person, I hope that we'll learn four principles of how we can deal with fear, stress, and anxiety in a time like this. Would you please join me as we ask God to bless this time together in His Word? Let's pray. Our gracious, loving, heavenly God, we thank you, Lord, for this time together in your word. And our prayer is that you will be the teacher, that you will teach us how to deal with this very important topic. We thank you for this, Lord, and we pray it in your name. Amen. Today we're going to visit with the prophet Elijah. Elijah a mighty Old Testament prophet. Now, if you're new to the Bible, let me just take a moment and explain what Old Testament prophets did. God lovingly told the nation of Israel, I want to have a relationship with you. I love you. 
let's, let's have this relationship. Did you know that's the true God of the Bible? That he's the God of relationship, that he actually wants to have a relationship with you. So God said, I want to have this relationship with you. And God even uses the illustration of marriage. He says, I love you. It's like we're married. Let's always stay committed to one another. Uh, But then, unfortunately, it was like God's people began stepping out on him. They became more and more unfaithful. They began to worship other gods. And God was brokenhearted. God was pleading with them, please come back to me. None of those other gods are real. None of them will be able to really love you like I can. And that's where the prophets come in. They were like God's messengers to the people. They were pleading with the people for God. Thus saith the Lord, I love you, and I I want you to come back. The people wouldn't listen. In fact, they became more and more unfaithful. It got rather bizarre. In fact, they, they began sacrificing their own children to some of these gods. Enter Elijah. God keeps lovingly making appeals to these people. And because God wants to make sure that these people recognize Elijah as the real deal, as a prophet from him, the true and living God, God anoints Elijah with miraculous powers. And at this point in our story, Elijah is on a roll. Do you ever have one of those seasons where you feel like everything is going your way? You probably don't feel like that right now. But that's where Elijah is right now. Everything's going his way. He's the man. He's on a roll. Again, God wants these people to know that Elijah is the real deal. So these are some of the things that God empowers Elijah to do. He miraculously multiplies food and feeds a widow and her son. He supernaturally runs 30 miles ahead of a chariot. Wow, Dash of the Incredibles has nothing on Elijah. Elijah supernaturally controls the weather for three years. He raised a young boy from the dead. And then Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel. Wow, what a scene this is. Elijah essentially rented out Mount Carmel, the Madison Square Garden of his day. And he challenges all the false prophets of all the false gods that the people have been worshiping. He makes like a public duel. Elijah goes toe-to-toe with them. 850 of these false prophets show up. Elijah is outnumbered 850 to 1. But Elijah says, okay, you make altars with sacrifices to your false gods, and I'll make an altar with a sacrifice to the one true living God. Let's see whose God is real. Let's see whose God shows up. It's a great scene, complete with trash talking and a lot of holy sarcasm. These false prophets 850 of them dance around all day, shouting, cutting themselves, doing all types of things to get their God's attention. Nothing. Their God, no show. Elijah prays one simple prayer, and bam, God shows up. He sends fire from heaven down and consumes the sacrifice in a millisecond. Wow. Elijah's victory is epic. He was outnumbered 850 to 1. It was decisive. It wasn't like he squeaked out an undeserved lucky victory in the last two minutes of Game 7. It's Game 1. Boom. Blowout. It's over. By the end, the whole crowd is chanting, Elijah, Elijah, Elijah. The Lord is God. The Lord is God. That's what the name means. The Lord is God. Confetti is falling from the ceiling. The bands are playing. What a moment. All those tremendous victories. 
You the man, Elijah. You the man. You might as well just call him Butter because he's on a roll. He is the mighty miracle minister with the powerful workings of God flowing through his life. All that sets the stage for where we find Elijah today. This is 1 Kings chapter 19. We'll begin our reading at verse 1. It says, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done. Okay, let's stop right there. Ahab is the king of Israel. Jezebel is the queen. This is quite a dysfunctional couple. Historians tell us that Ahab was a ruthless king. He could order your execution as easy as a pizza from Domino's. But if Ahab was bad, Jezebel the queen was a thousand times worse. This is one of those couples where they're both monsters. Jezebel is Cruella de Vil on steroids. Notice, they even have the same hair. Okay, so one of our lessons for today, avoid women with two-tone hair like that. Ahab was Kylo Ren and Darth Vader combined. <laughs> but Jezebel made him look like a saint. Jezebel. Scholars say her name means not exalted or dunghill. Hey, if your parents named you dunghill, you'd probably have some issues too. And she is clearly the boss of this marriage. Ahab is afraid of her. The last decision that Ahab got to make for himself was, I do. The Jewish historian Josephus tells us that Jezebel had been a Phoenician princess before she married Ahab. She marries King Ahab, and one of her goals is to introduce the false gods of the Phoenicians to Israel. She endeavors to make Phoenician idol worship the state-sanctioned religion of Israel. Sadly, she is successful in blinding King Ahab to the true God of Israel, and it results in the entire nation's downfall. So you might say, a Phoenician blinds Ahab, and it means curtains for Israel. One of the things that's interesting about doing church online is that there is no congregation here when we're filming this. So I can't hear you laugh at my attempts at jokes, which I guess is sort of like an average Sunday. Uh, let's read on. It says, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Uh, wait, uh, what happened? This is Elijah, the mighty miracle minister, the one who just stared down 850 false prophets, and now just one woman sends him running? Uh, what is going on here? Have you ever noticed sometimes fear is like that? It catches us by surprise. Other situations will happen and we'll be like, okay, I'm okay with that. I'm going to get through it. But then something comes along and it, for some reason, it just knocks you off the rails. Well, what is the solution when fear catches us by surprise? Uh, let's look at Elijah. Today we're going to learn from Elijah some things we can do with this type of fear. And frankly, there are some of these things that Elijah gets right, but we'll see that there are others that he gets wrong. Let's take a look. Verse 3 says, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Lord, take my life. 
God doesn't answer that prayer. Aren't you happy God doesn't answer all our prayers? I've had enough, Lord. Ever feel like that? There's that one final thing that comes along and pushes us over the edge. Elijah goes running away, plops himself down under a broom tree, and then has a, a Popeye moment. I can't stands no more, Lord. I just can't stands no more. But notice a mistake Elijah makes. It says, He left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He shut people out. Isolation. And although sometimes to get away for a little bit and catch our breath might be healthy, often fear and anxiety, they cause us to desire an unhealthy isolation. Elijah separated himself. Have you ever noticed that discouraged people tend to isolate themselves from people who otherwise might be able to help. Uh, that's a big mistake. The Bible tells us this. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The Bible tells us to never give up meeting together. It's important. Now, meeting together right now, that might be impossible physically. But fortunately for us, technologically, it's still possible. Even if it can't be physical gatherings, make sure you're still connecting with people. That is especially important during this quarantine time. Find others who can bring you encouragement and a perspective, especially believers who can encourage us in the things of God at this time. Find someone you can connect with and pray with. Every evening at 7 p.m., we have a 15-minute Zoom prayer meeting. That's been so important, so encouraging, so refreshing for us. Find opportunities. We may have to quarantine our bodies, but don't quarantine your soul. Reach out through social media to others. Look for ways to connect. Check up on some of the elderly people that you know. They call the quarantine social distancing. I'm not sure if I like that phrase. Practice physical distancing, yes. But socially, do not distance yourself from people. Look for ways to reach out. Thank God for Facebook and other social media. Did I just say that? Thank God for group texts. I never thought I'd say that. This coronavirus thing really has turned the world upside down. Some of you, what a great idea you've had. You've done drive-by distancing or walk-by waves where you've texted somebody and said, hey, could you come out on your porch in about 10 minutes? And from the safety of the street, you stop your car and you get out of your car and you wave to them or you uh, walk by and you wave and you talk to them for just a few minutes. What a great idea. And but many of you said, what a great blessing that's been to you and the others. Staying connected, reaching out to others is, is so important. It keeps us sane. Elijah isolates himself. And look how irrational he becomes. What does Elijah say that he's most frightened of? That someone will kill him. Elijah's afraid that someone will kill him. So what does he do? He goes running away from everyone, plops himself down under a broom tree, and what's the first thing he says? Lord, kill me. Does that sound a little irrational? So let's not isolate ourselves. Stay connected. Other believers can give us important faith-filled perspective. They can help us avoid irrational fears. Am I willing to admit I need others? I need their encouragement and 
wisdom at times. So, fear, antidote number one, keep connected. Verse five. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank, and then lay down again. Notice the gentleness of God. God doesn't tell the angel, yeah, go give him a good kick in the side and tell him, get up, get back into ministry, and stop your whining and complaining. (laughs) No. God tells the angel, tell him this. Hey, I made you some fresh bread. How does God minister to Elijah? Food and sleep. There is something so mundane about this scene. A loaf of bread and a jar of water. We'd expect something a lot more dramatic, a lot more spiritual. Then God simply breathed on Elijah and instantly recharged him like a spiritual ever-ready battery. No, but I think God deliberately did it this way to remind us of an important truth. God wired us to be whole people. And that's the way he ministers to us. So when you're dealing with stress and anxiety, take care of yourself. Treat yourself right. Make make sure you're eating properly, getting adequate rest. Sometimes getting a good night of sleep might be one of the most spiritual things we do. Write this down. Sometimes taking a nap might be the most spiritual thing we can do. Write that down. I prefer that you'd wait until the sermon is over, but write that down. Don't ever try to tell God that you're too spiritual to be concerned about eating properly and getting rest and going to a doctor. That's not honoring the way God wired us. And that's not honoring the way that he often chooses to minister to us. God ministers to Elijah in such loving down-to-earth, basic ways. There is such balance and common sense here. Fear antidote number two, keep balanced. Balance and common sense will go a long way during this pandemic. Don't forget to eat well and get proper rest. Verse seven, the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat. For the journey is too much for you. Again, how tender and loving. God sends another meal. And he says, the journey is too much for you. How loving. That's what God says to every one of us. Elijah is running in his own strength. He, he's anxious. He's running. He's running here and there. Lord, I haven't finished my COVID-19 bunker yet. Lord, I have to check on my supply of toilet paper. Lord, I'm still working on this recipe for hand sanitizer that I found on the internet. He's running. He's trying to control everything. Sometimes anxiety is a control issue. We get anxious because we think we can control everything. We can't. The coronavirus reminded us of that in living color. Maybe one of the reasons that the levels of fear are so high right now is we're realizing that ultimately we're not in control. We're not. Sometimes we think we are, but that's really just an illusion. So God says, Elijah, you're not going to be able to control the world right now. But here's what I want you to do. Take care of yourself and trust me. This journey is too much for you. 
God says to Elijah. And that's what he essentially wants to say to every one of us. Life. It's too much for you. I never intended you to try to do it alone in your own strength. God is hoping that we'll all realize that the journey is too much for us. He wants to do the journey with us. Relationship. Verse 8 says, So Elijah got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Wow, it says, Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights. Wow. What did he eat? I only wish we knew. It must have been like the ultimate protein power bar. Because on that single serving, he travels for 40 days and night out into the dangerous wilderness. Where does Elijah end up? Notice what it says. He ends up at Mount Horeb. The mountain of God. Mount Horeb. Another name for Mount Horeb is Mount Sinai. What do you know about Mount Sinai? Who else went up Mount Sinai? Moses went up Mount Sinai to meet with God and to receive the Ten Commandments. Elijah runs to Mount Sinai because he, he realizes something important for all of us to realize. When dealing with stress and anxiety and fear and worry, the physical is good, but it's not enough. The nap and the protein bar are, are good, but when I'm anxious, I need more than just the physical. I need to meet with God. Elijah runs to Mount Horeb. God, thanks for the physical. But when I'm anxious, what I need most is to hear a word from you. Verse 9. It says, There Elijah went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? God begins with a question. Whenever we hear God ask a question, we need to pay close attention. Because God is all-knowing, so it's not like he doesn't know the answer. He's probing Elijah. He asks the question not because God needs to hear the answer. Elijah needs to hear the answer. What are you doing here, Elijah? What is it exactly you need? Why are you, here? Why are you freaking out? What has you so anxious and worried? Verse 10, Elijah replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Lord, don't you care? Your ministry in this world is about to collapse. Your ministry in this world is about to become a nonprofit organization. Lord, I'm this really godly person. I'm the only one left. They're trying to kill me. I got big problems, so big that I'm not even sure if you could handle them. All right. Elijah is over-exaggerating a bit. He is not the only one left. And he knows that. And notice that he doesn't mention any of the great miracles and victories that God has given into his life. He doesn't even mention the 850 false prophets that he just stared down at Mount Carmel. Sometimes anxiety comes because we're listening to the lies and exaggerations of Satan. Satan's chief goal during a time of stress is to get our eyes off of our God and onto our problems. Focus is so important in combating fear. Elijah 
is focusing on his problems and forgetting his God. Notice the pronouns Elijah uses during his rant. I this, and I that, and I, 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 I'm the only one left. Someone has rightly pointed out that I is right in the middle of anxiety. When I am the only focus, I'm going to be anxious. Focus is so important. Satan would love to get our focus on our own strength, our own resources. He does not want your focus to be on your God. Elijah needs his focus readjusted. Fear antidote number three, keep your focus. One great way to do that is through worship and prayer. Make sure you include times of worship. Play worship songs, things that'll help us keep our faith-filled focus on God. Prayer. To his credit, Elijah cries out to God. That's good. And Elijah prays honestly. That's good. Did you know that you can cry out and be really honest with God? He knows what we're thinking anyway. That's good. But notice Elijah's prayer. His prayer is all over the place. He runs away from someone who wants to kill him, only to run away and hide in a cave, and then say to God, kill me. When he first prayed, he said, I am worthless, no better than my ancestors. Now he prays, I'm the only righteous person left in the world. Well, which is it? Is he the only righteous one left? Or is he worthless? Does he want to live or does he want to die? I would say Elijah is a little confused. Fear does that. We can get very confused. Our prayers, our emotions can go all over the place. Inordinate fear, panic, pessimism, self-pity. Elijah prays. That's good. Elijah pours out his heart honestly in prayer. That's good. Prayer is good, but not if the only focus of our prayer is on our problems. Prayer is meant to lift our focus from our problems to who God is in the midst of our problems. Focus is so important. God knows Elijah needs a focus adjustment. So, so look at what happens next. This is where the story really gets interesting. Verse 11. The Lord said, Elijah, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. God is saying, Elijah, you need a fresh encounter with who I am. Verse 11 again. It says, the Lord said, Elijah, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Elijah needs a fresh revelation of God. So he stands and waits. And a mighty wind begins to blow, and it begins to tear the mountain apart. Elijah thinks, this is it. This is it. The mighty manifestation of God in the great Hebraic tradition. Aha, here he is. Yes, this is it. But it wasn't it. 
God was not in the wind. Then all of a sudden, an earthquake. <laughs> Elijah, this is it. This has got to be it. Uh, but it wasn't it. The Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And then fire, raging fire. fire. This must be like the burning bush. This is it, Elijah thought. This must be it. Third time's a charm. Uh, but it wasn't a charm this time. The Lord wasn't in the fire either. Elijah is waiting. We join him there, don't we? Maybe right now you're in a very difficult situation, going through a tough season, and you're waiting. We're waiting for a great manifestation of God a great power sign that's going to change our predicament. When all the dramatic displays were over, then came a gentle whisper. God was in the whisper. This time, God was in the whisper. When Elijah heard it, he knew. It says he pulled his cloak over his face. He realized he was in the presence of the living God. What a stunning scene. Why the whisper? Don't we need a dramatic power display of God right now? Why the whisper? When I was a kid, I was hyperactive. And I think all my friends were hyperactive. We used to run around all day long. But I remember when my friend Ron's mom wanted to connect with him during the day. We'd be out running around, playing wiffle ball out in the street. And most moms would just stand on their porch and holler to one of their kids. Well, Ron's mom would do that too. But sometimes she would do something very interesting. Sometimes she would just come out to her front porch. And when she knew she had Ron's attention, she would just whisper. And Ron would be looking at his mom. What'd you say, mom? I can't hear you. And she would just That's your best, your best, your best, your best. continue to talk really softly. And he'd be like, mom, I can't hear you. That's exactly what she wanted. That's what she wanted all along. It worked every time. Finally, Ron would say, hey guys, I'll be right back. And he'd go running over to his mom. And when he got there, she would give him a hug and tell him whatever she wanted to tell him and then kiss him on the forehead. And then he'd come back to the game. I'm not sure what exactly she told him, but what she communicated was much more than simply words. She hugged him with who she was. She kissed him. Sometimes when we're running around frantic, we're not going to hear what we need most. Sometimes we think a dramatic display of earth-splitting power is what we need when we're frightened. That's typically what we want. But none of those things would do it for Elijah. He didn't need to know what God could do. What he needed most was to know who God is. During this COVID-19 epidemic, everything is being shaken. Our routines, our jobs, our school academics. Elijah was accustomed to God revealing himself in dramatic, attention-grabbing, star-spangled ways. But this time God says, Elijah, 
Elijah, you can trust my character. Fear antidote number four, remember God's character. Remember God's promises in case you're not sure of God's love for you. In case Satan has really lied to you about who God is and how much he loves you and cares for you. Let's just remember that God came to our earth in the person of Jesus Christ. God incarnate. He came here to die on a cross for you and me. When fear begins to rise in my heart, am I remembering that character of God? A God who loves you so much that he was willing to become your substitute and pay for your sin to ransom you back. Is, is that the God I know? Is that the character of God I'm embracing today? Is that the God I'm allowing to hug me and whisper to me that he has me covered? That's a God we can trust. That's a God who proved his love for us. God bless you.